I'm really glad you all are here to talk about Greg Oil today. Um, how many of you were the webinar or have watched it? Pretty much everybody. And then uh, has anybody read his third book, The Whole Language? So several of you here. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether you have watched or read. That's part of the reason that we are here today is to be able to, to talk about it. Um, so one of the things that is foundational for Greg Boyle is that what he calls the notion of God. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, I hate to, to get these beautiful faces off our screen, but I'm going to share my screen um, and, and share a quote that he begins his book with. And it's also the place that he begins his uh, pretty much his talk with. So let's see. Make sure everybody's in there. Okay, so um, he says, and this is the first line of the book, he said, nothing is more of more, excuse me, nothing is more consequential in our lives than the notion of God we hold, not God, the notion of God. So I wanted just to, for us to spend a little bit of time thinking about what our individual notion of God is. I want you to think back to your six-year-old self. <sighs> So, um, and what your notion of God was, what you thought about God, what you envisioned, and welcome you all to share that uh, if you would be willing to. And I'm putting some folks on mute, but you're welcome to take yourself off mute if you would like to like to talk. This is Joan. Um, yeah, the first thing that came to mind as a six-year-old was Santa Claus. Um, and, and I think there was, you know, there's mystery for a six-year-old um, with how does Santa get down the chimney? And uh, I swear uh, to God that I was wide awake and how did he arrive and me not know, you know, and all, you know, all of that fun stuff that a six-year-old might have, but also the, uh, the giving. Um, you know, the um, abundant, you know, the jovial. Um, so that was my notion. But have you been naughty or nice? <laughs> I was always yeah. nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you should have known that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Joan. Um, you was naughty. <laughs> you oh, were uh, naughty or Mott was naughty? <laughs> we were both naughty. Yeah. <laughs> else um have a memory rich, rich you well, I, was yeah. say, uh, I was thinking more in terms of, i think a six-year-old target i mean six, sixth grade or whatever i'm going back hard to go back that far but i think it was more creator all-powerful uh -huh. is kind of what you're envisioning at that age uh -huh. and growing into the idea of our god is love uh -huh. so even even early age you that was still a possibility that god of love not there yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Just he was far away. Like he was in heaven. And okay. Down here. Okay. As a kid, that's always thought. Yeah. So for you Zoomers, I don't know if you've heard Kathy uh, Bradley say he was far away. Up, up, up there in the mm -hmm. heavens with the clouds and the beautiful chairs mm -hmm. you could look at in the stained glass windows. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So he was definitely other uh, elsewhere. That's and right. definitely old, male, and white. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. That was my picture yeah. six. And, you know, kind of like Charlton Heston in the last, whatever that is. Yeah. Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Kind of that look. Yeah. Yeah. And, and me. Not me, but me. Stern. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Stern. Barb. Um, I, I just think back at six, um, all my family was going to church at a first friend's not here. <laughs> um, like, both of my except the grandparents and my parents and somehow every Sunday knowing it was important to be there this is a big deal this is a big guy uh -huh. <laughs> and just this feeling of um boy this is this is neat <laughs> yeah um, yeah so in, important. important he, he was a, yeah, he was a VIP important. yeah and he was usually that how many most people envisioned it um I want to jump forward to you're about you're in high school uh, but then you begun to make decisions for yourself you're not just relaying what you've been taught um 
any thoughts or, and we'll, we'll say high school college. Any thoughts if God changed for you or kind of looking at you folks on Zoom as well, if you have input. <clears throat> Emily? Um, maybe a little bit more spiritual and maybe more opportunity for personal connection. We did some retreats at the beach with journaling and Bible studies that, in college that were full of prayer. So like a little bit more personal relationship opportunity. That's great. I mean, it's good to hear. Um, I'm stepping away because I forgot to get the uh, clipboard for us to sign in. The contact tracing. <clears throat> um, anybody else get, just has a fault? Uh, Claire? Well, along the way, I, uh, and many of you also probably participated in a class learning to catechism. So there were some words, I won't quote it exactly right, but what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchanging in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, and truth, something like that. Yeah. And so, so I began to have some words to attach to God that were very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it, 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 there, there was an evolution. Oh, yes. Anybody, uh, Rich? Yeah, I would say from that uh, early just creator image, the, the, really that that uh, confirmation was important for me to get more of a theological and actually redeemer. I think is the word that I really became aware of that that concept of God. I think at that age, and it was more in college. Actually, after college, I became more aware of the personal strength that you can uh, get from that grace. So you all have have um, described a, a relationship with God that was certainly in line with where you were developmentally, um, and and it sounds like a fairly positive one, aside from being stern but strict. Oh man! I, I remember in those kind of high school years, hearing some things that I really didn't like, and just kind of fighting against them. Like I didn't like the idea of like how to believe the things that I'm like, oh, I like. It just never fit. With yeah. and I've been very uncomfortable with certain groups you might be in when you're hearing that. I'm like, this is not fit with what I, yeah. for some reason, I didn't. That wasn't right. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that and had a similar experience in my growing up. So, as I said, Greg Boyle has made this absolutely foundational about your notion of God. So, let's hear him talk about it and then we'll discuss that. So. Meister Eckhart, a, a mystic and theologian who lived many years ago, uh, used to say, it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort you. Now, we kind of don't believe that. But I think it's true that once you kind of know what kind of God we have, it alters everything. My friend, uh, Mirabai Starr, who's a mystic, and writes about mystics. She says, once you know the God of love, you fire all the other gods, <laughs> which is kind of an essential task of maturation. As you grow and evolve, the God becomes larger. I remember I had a spiritual director once who, who said, we need a better God than the one we have. He was a Jesuit. But I know exactly what he means. I mean, we've settled for a partial God instead of holding out for the God we actually have. The God who is too busy loving us to have any time left for anything else. This will always reflect how you are in the world as you seek to create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. It's absolutely consequential. If your God is partial and puny, well, then you have no choice. You're going to be that in the world. And our invitation is always to be in the world who God is, compassionate, loving, 
and kind. Okay. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to get some people connected and um, let me ask Zoom. So I'm sorry that you can't, I'm, I'm chatting with Connie Carlson who says that you all can't see it. Let me, let me try it a different way and, and we'll try to get it in. <clears throat> but for now, um, thinking about that, this, this first quote that he came up with, the Meister Eckhart quote, it is a lie the thought of God that does not comfort you. So I'm, I'm just curious, do you, how would you put this in your own words? Sorry. The positive and to the positive aspect of God loving us always, which he, Later brings up rather than negative about. So this what I'm hearing you say is that that particular quote doesn't that doesn't feel out of place for you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have, have an observation about that quote or some of the other things, the nearby star, you know. We, we fire our other gods. So his, his point, again, is that it is absolutely foundational. And he uses the phrases like, um, well, I'm not sure if he uses in this one or not, but in the book, he talks about um, it, that it's really easy for us to see only, if we've got a negative view of God, we can only see a negative view of ourselves. That's sort of the foundation part of it, that we, um, what, how we see God seeing us, we see other people. So getting this God part right is an important thing. Um, any other thoughts on this other, on this clip before we move on? Yeah, um, this business of firing all other gods, I, I don't know anybody uh, quite truthfully has fired all other gods. Maybe, um, Maybe Father Greg has, but for one, I sure serve a lot of gods. Uh, money, greed, um, holding on to what I have, denying others. Uh, I mean, the list is a pretty long list. Um, if I was to go about firing gods, it'd take me a long time, if I, even if I could. Well, and, and um, John, I mean, that's a really honest comment. I think Greg Boyle is going maybe another step further, not just the gods that are around us, but our understanding of the full God and the fullness of God. And that he, he uses the phrase that allow the tender gaze to rest on me and the, uh, the tender gaze of the one. And then I can um, apply that tender gaze to other people. You know, the, the, the other thing, and I'll be quiet, but the other God that you follow is yourself. And I say you, I mean me. Um, if, if you are, Claire mentioned those words of if you're kind, if you're loving, if you're gracious, if you're good in every respect, uh, she was, I start thinking about myself. It's not pretty. Yeah. And again, that, that's an honest self-assessment. Um, and I, I appreciate that. I think, I think you could say we. <laughs> you don't need to just say me. Um, Minna, you had a yeah, comment. I, I mean, I do like what he's saying very much. And I talk to other people about this book, and they think it lists people off too easy. There's no judging or holding people to the account. And I think that's the way it should be. But it's not easy to judge or hold people to account. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like some of the churches that I grew up in, the emphasis was so much on sin mm -hmm. that this was like a revelation of like, oh, okay, you don't have to feel bad all the time. And so I, I enjoyed this book. Yeah. Yeah. Barb, you were getting ready to say yeah. um, I liked what he said about as you get older, your God gets bigger. And I, I felt that, that yeah. over the years, I mean, God is so much bigger than what I think. And I have to kind of let my mind expand. <laughs> um, 
to really hear God. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that sort of gets back to, to where John was that, I mean, there, there are lots of layers to this, but one of them is, is understanding, recognizing, and embracing a, a big, big God. David, it looks like you jumped on screen, are you? Yeah, I was going to say something that supported John's perspective, because I think we do intend to fire the gods that don't comfort us, but there's so many gods that comfort us that if we don't replace them with God, capital G God, um, we're fooling ourselves. So when we make ourselves God, and that's comforting for us, because if we're in control and we're self-reliant and we don't need help from anyone else, that's putting us first. And that's a comfort to us. Now, when that falls apart, as it will, we get a revelation that maybe we should be firing that part of who we think God is, which is me. Again, I, I, I would say I completely agree with that, but I would say that Greg Boyle is asking us even bigger to think of the God that we believe in as being even bigger, such that that God sees all those flaws in us and loves us. And so we recognize our own, uh, our own image of God in ourselves before we see it in others. How you yeah, I was going to say, I've been struggling with his view or understanding of God because it does seem, as Minna said, uh, indulgent. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the way I reconcile it is he, God does see our flaws, but notwithstanding them, loves us and redeems us and therefore, we ought to do the same with other people. Right. So it's not that God is indulgent, it's uh -huh. God is loving. Right. In spite of our flaws. Or, or that God is uh, turns a blind eye. Um, he says at one point in his book, we've settled for forgiveness when what we're getting is mercy. And so we, we have the merciful God who loves us in spite. So your comment, Hal, is a good segue into the next video. I, um, I will say, sorry would we'll say um, that he is asking us, and I'll just this sort of summarizes, he's asking us, or he's saying, until we can see in ourselves what he calls unshakable goodness, common dignity, noble hearts, we're not able to see others that way. I mean, that's sort of a, that's sort of teeing up this next uh, video that has to do with it going to the margins. So, okay. so about 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to imagine something different and we greet them and the centerpiece is our 18-month training program every single gang member who walks through our doors comes barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace and the only thing that can scale that wall is tenderness and so you have to kind of choose to be in the world who god is and, and you want every breath you take to cherish in the same way that God cherishes us. Every single gang member walks through our doors, thousands of them. There are 120,000 in all of Los Angeles County. Every single one walks through with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was either frightened or frightening. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. And so if it's true that the traumatized are going to be more likely to cause trauma, it's equally true that a cherished person will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. And so... But homies often say at Homeboy Industries that, you know, we're used to being watched. We're not used to being seen. And you go to the margins to see people. I was in Houston once. I was giving a talk and a, a young guy, a former gang member covered in tattoos who was uh, had been to prison. But at that moment, he was working 
with gang members in the streets of Houston as a hardcore gang intervention worker. And he came up to me and a very earnest guy. And, and he said, how do you reach them? And I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you receive who they are? Can you allow your heart to be altered by the people you encounter? You don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different which all connects back to the original uh, covenant, you know, where our exhausted God says, as I have loved you, so must you have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and stranger. And so God identifies these kind of subgroupings of the poor because God thinks these are the folks who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered greatly and in exactly this way, God thinks these are precisely the people who will be our trusted and trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship of God. It's how we get to kinship. You know, service is a good place to start. But service is the hallway that gets you to the ballroom. And the ballroom is the place of kinship and connection where you obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them. Okay. So a um, lot in that one. I, I love that. Uh, and we're, we'll jump right into um, one. I'm interested in y'all's thoughts, but we'll start here. He, he's talking to the gang interventionists and he says, how do you reach them? Uh, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you receive who they are? Can you allow your heart to be altered by the people you encounter? So let's talk through that. I and mean, what does that look like? In actual living well i, I will say this it, it's uh the question that comes to my mind is well, how do we go about doing this i mean do we just go uh, out to these margins and i'm going to assume that to mean um people that our service industries in the church are attempting to reach out to uh, it, it obviously has everything to do with the spirit in which we reach out, meaning are we here to help them or are we here to be changed? That Meaning we help them, they are different than us. When in effect, Father Boyle, Father Greg is saying, no, they're not. He's, there's this distance that's been created by us. And so how do we go out and essentially I would say it's not his words, but get on the same playing field with these people. They're no different from us. Um, they've been dealt a different set of cards, but in the final analysis, they're no different from us. So how does our heart get changed by going out in the field? I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I have felt differently in certain ministries that I've been engaged in, but um, I don't know why or how that happened. But quit trying to do for other people. Go out there and really try to do for yourself to get on the same playing field. That's that's a. You asked the ultimate question: is how do you do that? Um, but that's good. Good uh, sort of summary of what we're trying to do, Tristan. So I was speaking back to what you said about, or what he was saying. The gang members were saying about um, how they're used to being watched, not used to being seen. And for me, I feel like that's a big part of this is just starting to see people and not just watch people, which maybe is something that is hard to do within the walls of the church. Um, and I don't think it necessarily has to be like when you're going to meet someone on the margins. And within that is like the service industry stuff of, you know, going to the roof above and, you know, our homeless neighbors on the street and whatnot. But, you know, that could be the political margins or the familial margins or the social margins of people you may have lost contact with that you just know you're not on the same wavelength as and 
starting to see them for all the inner workings that are going on as opposed to the watching and then thinking about how you can help them from like your ideal frame of mind and not the actual experience of what might be beneficial on a two-way street. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a good, again, a good summary. So um, Elise and then Barb. <clears throat> The nice trips, I'm sure, <laughs> and our mission trips to Mexico, that's just an easy way to be on watch and learn from them because all the times we go down there and work with them, we're doing things very differently. We're doing it their way and learning from them and learning their lifestyle and learning all the gifts that they bring us as opposed to our going in and trying to do things yeah. gringo way <laughs> and trying yeah. to force our thoughts on them. That's a that's a great example. Um, yeah, you're not doing it our way. Yeah, and you know the right part said you you're not going down there thinking you have all the answers. And I'm I'm not saying you because I believe that that's the mentality of our of our global missions is we don't think we have the answers we're going to to be with as opposed to teach or whatever. Then this is this oh, sounds great, but as I was listening to this, I started thinking about it. I thought, you know, there's an uncomfortableness sometimes when you're on the margin talking to people who are different, live in such different lives from you. And I started thinking, maybe I'm a little bit afraid to be seen because I'm a little bit embarrassed that, like, they are living such hard lives. And after we have our meal and get room in the end, I'm going to go get my car and my phone. And it's just such a different life that it's almost, it's humbling for sure. It's almost embarrassing. To, to try to be, to try to understand them, and you kind of don't even want them to know what your life is like. You don't want to to reveal too much of what your life is like because maybe I don't want to be seen. It's a kind of strange feeling to talk about. That that is that's very interesting. Um, or that you had your hand up. Well, I'm just thinking on the they want to be seen, not watched. I think the see you can also think of as listen. Right. Uh, if like a room in the end when you're having dinner, if you just listen to their stories, it validates them as a person and that you care about them to listen to them. And I don't think you have to <laughs> really to um, have them feel like somebody knows knows a little bit about yeah. them. Yeah, that's an important part. And Kathy. And along the same lines too, I feel like when you're watching, you're judging. Whereas when you're being seen and in a relationship with a person, you're you're seeing each other for who you really are. So when you're standing back and watching, I think we make judgments about why people were in situations they're in. Um, and when you take yourself out of the watching and actually like this and have to bring in the end where you're just giving your life to go, <laughs> that's where you really see each other for who we all are. Yeah. The good good assessment. Um Joan, you've got your hand up and Emily, so Joan first and then Emily. Yeah, just quickly. I think, um, you know, I love the, the, the service that our church does. Um, we did uh, room at the inn a couple of times, and that's a great example of, um, of listening. And, um, but I, I'm wondering if we can't uh, keep this more simple in our, in our life and notice things that we consider margins. So, um, in my own life story, both my parents um, had dementia. And so I got exposed to um, the elderly, you know, in seniors and, and all of that and how they can be at the margins too. And, and they are, uh, they are in our life. So, you know, to John's point, how do we get started? But we have people that we would view as, as margins, um, uh, that uh, that we may have um, may, may be very impatient around, and how can we how can we practice what um, Father Boyle is saying in the stuff that's right in our lives? That's uh, that, and Tristan was sort of making that point as well about who is on the margins. It's not just people who are poor or people who are um, recovering from alcohol or drug addiction. It's it include it's more inclusive. 
Emily, you had a comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to add that last part, um, allowing your heart to be altered by the people you encounter. It just, it sounds a lot more fun than, um, than treating everything like a task or a job or widgets. Um, you know, pers I spend a lot of my time, you know, either tutoring kids or working with staff and it's, it would just be a lot more fun to approach it as an opportunity for me to be changed than, than tasks to get done. Um, and I really liked his, his answer to Penn's question about burnout and that burn is irrelevant for him at this point. I mean, part of it was about being present and being present in every single moment. Um, and I think that kind of ties into part of this message too. Yeah, that's one of our clips that we're not going to get to all four clips, unfortunately, but that, that's a point. He talks about uh, one of the ways to keep from being burned out is uh, anchored in the present moment, delighting in the person in front of you. That's where the joy is, which I think is, is to your point. Um, I'm going to skip through because I do want to get to at least one more of our clips. Um, one of the things that I think is key, and I don't think we'll have time to talk about it, is considering the widow's orphans and strangers as our guides. So that will be, that's a takeaway to, to keep that in mind. Um, I think the other thing that we've, we've touched at here is this quote, service is a good place to start, but service is the hallway on the way to the ballroom. It gets you to the ballroom. The ballroom is the place of kinship and connection. So one of the takeaways as I was studying this this week and listening is, am I always on my way to somewhere or am I there? Am I always getting ready to listen, but I'm not really listening. So that would be a takeaway. Um, we have a clip on the burnout question. This is, I'm gonna do this democratically. We have burnout question and we have um, the one where um, someone asked, how do you get around the othering and the griping? If you had a choice between those two, which, which would you do? And I, I'll get y'all's input to on Zoom. Is the burnout the question, and the, what you burn, the burnout question is the first one. And the second question was um, about othering and griping. How do we get around othering and griping? Right. So. <laughs> right. Oh, burnout, griping. How about you on Zoom? Speak out, because I can't see all of you. One have more interest to you than others. Griping. Griping. Yeah, agreed. Othering, griping. Okay. Well, the way Greg Boyle works is that every one of his themes is woven with every one of his themes. So we'll get a little bit of get a little bit of both. How, how, so, um, how do we transcend the griping and the othering with those that do not think like us? Yeah, I, I think we don't. I don't think we name things correctly, you know, and and it gets us in trouble and so like who, who do we who do we think we're seeing you know how do we diagnose things you know what's our analysis so and i i hope this isn't too controversial but i mean it's like you know so our doctors refuse to do tattoo removal you cannot enter our clinic which is in our headquarters unless you can show proof that you're vaccinated because it's too close quarters. <laughs> and a lot of them are older doctors who are retired and who are vulnerable. So, so homie, uh, you know, wanted to get vaccinated. I mean, I'm sorry, he wanted to get his tattoos removed. And I said, are you vaccinated? And he said, no. So I said, why aren't you vaccinated? And he says, I don't know what's in it. And so I was, we, we have, I was, we were texting. And so I was at an In-N-Out burger, which is famous in Los Angeles and like the best burgers in town. So I sent him a picture of, of the In-N-Out burger. And I said, I don't know what's in this, but it tastes delicious. And I'm trusting that, you know, people aren't going to poison my Burger, I, I, I just trust. Now, who trusts? Healthy people do. In fact, it may well be how we measure health, if you trust. Now, now obviously, this guy is, he's not savvy. He's wounded. 
He's not on to something. He's injured. And we name these things incorrectly. And But our starting point, I think, has to be the same as the God of love, which is to say everybody's unshakably good, no exceptions. We belong to each other, no exceptions. And how do we love each other into wholeness? But if you think that there's such a thing as somebody who isn't good, then you're going to have difficulties doing this. If you think there are some people who don't belong to us, it's going to be hard when it comes to the other. Because, and and I will, I think we have to admit as church that that we've kind of backed the wrong horse on this kind of thing. So, I mean, the truth is moralism has never kept us moral. It's only kept us from each other. And I think we have to agree that that's the opposite of God's dream come true. That kinship is God's dream come true, that you may be one. Jesus says it pretty clearly that you may be one. That's all I want. It's not about do good and avoid evil. Once you know the joy of kinship and the the God of love and you're firing all the other gods, nobody needs to tell you the difference between right and wrong. We've settled for kind of moralism, but we should hold out for something better. The poet Wallace Stevens says, We live in the description of the place and not the place itself. So somehow God wants us to stop settling for the description of the place and really hold out for the place itself, which is kinship and connection and and, and oneness. Okay, once again, it's packed. I, I, I think this idea of naming things incorrectly is, a, is a, something that is important for us to grasp. Um, and I've, I've got his quote here. Um, and, and all this, like, what's he saying? How would you, how would you describe this? So um, I would keep that in mind. And then um, it, I will show his quote here in the interest. Uh, sorry, the comments here. Um, this is kind of his answer to his question. Our starting point has to be the same as the God of love. And then he goes through this, everybody's unshakably good. We all belong to each other. And we, and, and this is my summary here. We see as God sees and we are to be in the world as God is. So how, how is it that we make that transformation from naming things, categories, good, bad, clean, druggy, um, formerly incarcerated, um, innocent. How, how do we make that transition from categories to this oneness that he perceives as God's dream? I, I can just say something. Um, like kind of thinking it kind of reminds me of sort of the notion of sort of what happened to you and not what's wrong with you um in terms of people going through trauma and when justin perry did our class on racism he started with the um he started with the attachment a lot about the attachment cycle and so it just i think it ties into what greg boyle is saying in terms of people we're all wounded in different ways that color how we see things but at our base before all of that, we are, we're good. And just remembering that. Tristan. Um, I think honestly, it starts at a more personal level than it does with other people. So I think, well, she can listen to my opinion, but I think you need to start, or you need to stop rather othering yourself as opposed to othering other people. Does that make sense? Um, so like stop the self-talk of, oh, I'm not one of them or, I'm better, you know, I'm already doing this. So if they calm down, I think you have to put it on yourself and stop. In in one sense, that could be exceptionalizing yourself. In the other sense, it could be berating yourself as well, detaching yourself from the reality of who you are and 
who God sees you to be in real time. And then I think once you get to that point, it's a lot easier once you have that realization of, of you know, putting either the exceptionalization parade of who you are, then you can get to a point of, of with other people saying, like, I know, you know, where I stand. And because then you're not attempting to, you know, reconcile things with other people. Well, in the meantime, you're kind of having a false reality going on in your own head. Yeah. And I, I like that. And you know, people use the phrase, you need to get, get right with God. And I think part of what he's saying is you're already right with God, but what you got to get right with is yourself <laughs> um, and under you understand yourself as in this unitive sense, understand yourself as one with others. I'm way paraphrasing what, paraphrasing what you said, but yeah. I appreciate the perspective. I'm looking, uh, I can only see a few of you on Zoom. So if you have a comment, speak up. He mentioned at one point <clears throat> either in the talk or in his book that as Jesus said there with Jesus there is not they or them, it's all we and us. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Which emphasizes that. Yes, absolutely. Um, it does. Mm -hmm. Which kind of brings me to <clears throat> this next slide, which is well, if you think there's such thing as somebody who isn't good, you're gonna have a hard time with the othering, and I think that's the getting right. But he talked about this moralism. Moralism has never got uh, kept us moral. It's only kept us from each other. And what does he, in this case, what does he mean by moralism? Which is sort of a lawyer. I think seeing both yourself and other people as rule breakers, <laughs> as yeah. opposed to loving someone and seeing rule breaking as that doesn't define somebody. That's just a symptom of a disease that we all have. Yeah, I like I like that. It doesn't define you, and it's a symptom. Um, and I think that's what he's saying when he says that the the homie's not savvy; he's wounded. He's not on something. He's injured. Um, which gets, I think, to what you were saying. At least um, he uses the quote after that. After this. Thing he says, uh, well, he said, Oh, here is he said, um, moralism has never kept us moral. That's the opposite of God's dream come true. Kinship is God's dream come true. And he says that Jesus talks about that. That in, in John, he says, You know, he's praying on behalf of others. And he said that, you know, pro faith, Father, I pray that they will be one as you and I are one. So he's he, Jesus, is seeking that unity for all. And Greg Boyle was encouraging us to come from that place of unity as we interact with others. Um, I'm flying through here because we'll need to fly. Um, I'm going to just finish with this quote that seemed to sum up a lot of what we said, but it showed up in my inbox um, week before last that compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded, it's a relationship between equals. And it's only when we know our inner darkness well, that we can be present to the darkness of others. And I feel like that's a lot of what uh, Tristan was saying earlier, that understanding our own darkness frequently comes from a place of not understanding ourselves as being, having been created in the image of God and being loved and cherished and treated tenderly by God. So it comes from a place of our own grounding in that. So that then we go out into the world and see others as God sees. Okay. Any other closing comments? I know it's uh, worship time, but anything else? Anybody on Zoom? Stop. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we could have spent several weeks on this session, but thank you all for being part of it and for your input. So we'll see you next week.